All right, welcome back. This is Heart Physiology, uh, part four. We just finished up this um, summary of the cardiac cycle. I want to make sure that you understand that you need to be able to understand the different parts of this and how they are all coordinated. There are two sounds, lub and dub, which are associated with the closing of the heart valves. Lub is the closing of the AV valves at the beginning of the ventricular systole. The dub sound is the closing of the semilunar valves at the beginning of ventricular diastole. The pause between lub dubs indicates heart relaxation. Let's see if this works. So it's lub dub, lub dub. All right. All right, so that video goes through the two sounds again. The mitral valve closes slightly before the tricuspid and the aortic closes slightly before the pulmonary. So you're really hearing the mitral valve and the aortic. <clears throat> the differences allow um, auscultation of each valve when the stethoscope is placed in four different regions. This slide shows the different regions or the areas of auscultation to hear the valves. Those of you going on to nursing will definitely need to know these areas and be able to auscultate the areas. We have the aortic valve, which is heard in the second intercostal space at the right sternal margin. The pulmonic valve is heard in the second intercostal space at the left sternal margin. Mitral valve sounds are heard over the heart's apex, which is the fifth intercostal space um, in the midclavicular mid line. And the tricuspid valve sounds are typically heard in the right sternal margin of the fifth intercostal space. So you typically go the aortic, pulmonary, mitral, tricuspid when you do your auscultation. Heart murmurs are abnormal heart sounds heard when blood hits obstructions. They usually indicate valve problems. An incompetent or insufficient valve is one that fails to close completely allowing the backflow of blood. This causes a swishing sound as blood regurgitates backwards from ventricle into atria. A stenotic valve is one that fails to close complete, or I'm sorry, open completely, restricting blood flow through the valve. This causes a high-pitched sound or clicking as blood is forced through a narrow valve. Next, we're going to cover cardiac output. You have a whole, another whole lecture or another video on this topic, but I'm covering it here as well. Cardiac output is the volume of blood pumped by a single ventricle in one minute. Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. Heart rate is in beats per minute, and stroke volume is the volume of blood pumped out by one ventricle with one beat. The normal cardiac output is 5.25 liters per minute. 
This equation down here shows us how we get the 5.25 uh, liters per minute. An average heart rate is 75 beats per minute. We multiply that by a normal stroke volume of 70 milliliters per beat, and that gives us 5.25 liters per minute. A maximum cardiac output is four to five times the resting cardiac output in a non-athletic person, so approximately 20 to 25 liters per minute. But it may reach 35 liters per minute in trained athletes. Cardiac output is affected by factors that affect both stroke volume and heart rates. And I'm going to go over these factors. So stroke volume regulation. Stroke volume is the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume. The end diastolic volume is affected by the length of the ventricular diastole and also venous pressure. And systolic volume is affected by atrial blood pressure and the force of the ventricular contraction. Normal stroke volume is 120 milliliters minus 50 milliliters or 70 milliliters per beat. So it's typically 70 milliliters per beat. And we're, our normal end diastolic volume is 120 and the end systolic volume is, one, is 50. Three main factors affecting stroke volume are preload, contractility, and afterload. Preload involves the degree of stretch of the heart muscle. Preload is the degree to which the cardiac muscle cells are stretched just before they contract. So if you pull the rubber band back, how far is that stretched before you let go of it? Changes in preload cause changes in stroke volume by affecting end diastolic volume. The relationship between prelobe and stroke volume is called the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. Cardiac muscle exhibits length tension relationship. At rest, cardiac muscle cells are shorter than optimal length, and this leads to a dramatic increase in contractile force. The most important factor in preload stretching of cardiac muscle is venous return, or the amount of blood returning to the heart. Slow heartbeat and exercise increase venous return. Increased venous return distends or stretches the ventricles and increases the contraction force. Stroke volume is also affected by contractility. Contractility is the contractile strength of each muscle length. At, um, at a given muscle length. So contractility is the contractile strength at a given muscle length. It is independent of muscle stretch and end diastolic volume. Increased contractility lowers the end systolic volume and is caused by sympathetic epinephrine release, which leads to calcium influx and more cross bridge formations. Positive ionotropic agents increase contractility. These include thyroxine, glucagon, epinephrine, digitalis, high extracellular um, calcium. Negative ionotropic agents decrease contractility and, and include acidosis or excess um, hydrogen atoms, increased extracellular calcium, or uh, extracellular potassium, sorry, increased extracellular potassium, and calcium channel blockers. Figure 18.22 shows how the positive ionotrope, norepinephrine, uses a cyclic AMP second messenger system to increase heart contractility. Norepinephrine, up here, attaches to a B1 adrenergic receptor in the cell membrane. This causes GDP <clears throat> on a messenger to become GTP. The G protein then active attaches to the adenylate cyclase, converting ATP to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP then goes on to activate the protein kinase, affecting the cell in three different ways. First, the active protein kinase phosphorylates the plasma membrane calcium channels 
increasing the calcium influx. So more calcium can come in. The increased calcium influx enhances the actin-myosin interaction by binding to troponin. This increases muscle contraction. Activated protein kinase also phosphorylates the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium channel, um, calcium ion channels. This also increases the intracellular calcium, and we've just covered what the increased calcium ions results in, the increased force of muscle contraction. Lastly, the active protein kinase phosphorylates the sarcoplasmic um, calcium ion pumps, speeding the calcium removal and relaxation, making more calcium available for the release on the next heartbeat. So we can see how this all affects down here. And basically, more calcium binds to troponin, the cross bridges um, binding increase, and the force of contraction increases. <clears throat> The last way the body regulates stroke volume is by affecting afterload. Afterload is the back pressure exerted by atrial blood pushing on the uh, semilunar valves. <coughs> Excuse me. Afterload is pressure that the ventricles must overcome to eject blood. The aortic pressure is around 80 millimeters per of, micro, um, of mercury. The pulmonary press trunk pressure is about 10 millimeters of mercury. Hypertension increases afterload, resulting in increased ESV and reduced stroke volume. Figure 18.21 is a nice summary of the factors, the factors determining cardiac output. <clears throat> so cardiac output right here is affected by stroke volume and heart rate, and we just discussed the stroke volume. Above stroke volume, we see increased EDV, or preload, is a result from increased venous return. Increased ventricle filling time due to a decreased heart rate and also exercise caused, causes the increased venous return. Following the idea of regulating the cardiac output, we now move into the regulation of heart rate. If stroke volume decreases as a result of decreased blood volume or a weakened heart, the cardiac output can be maintained by increasing the heart rate. So if we go back to this, um, if the stroke volume is decreased, this can still remain the same if we increase our heart rate. Positive chronotropic factors increase our heart rate, whereas negative chronotropic factors decreases it. The heart rate can be regulated by the autonomic nervous system, chemicals, and other factors. The autonomic nervous system regulates or can regulate heart rate. Sympathetic stimulation increases heart rate and parasympathetic nervous system stimulation decreases the heart rate. Acetylcholine hyperpolarizes pacemaker cells by opening potassium channels. This lowers or slows the heart rate. The parasympathetic activity has little or no effect on contractility. The heart at rest exhibits vagal tone. Parasympathetic nervous system is a dominant influence on the heart rate. Oops, I'm on the wrong one. Parasympathetic nervous system is dominant uh, as far as the influence on the heart rate. That means it affects heart rate more than the sympathetic nervous system. It decreases the rate by about 25 beats per minute. And if we take away the vagal nerve stimulation, the heart rate is an average of about 100 beats per minute. When sympathetic is, nervous system is activated, the parasympathetic is inhibited and vice versa. The atrial bane bridge reflex says that the sympathetic reflex initiated by increased venous return increases atrial filling. Atrial walls are stretched with increased volume, stimulating the SA node, which increases heart rate. This also stimulates atrial stretch receptors that activate sympathetic reflexes. Here we see uh, figure 1821 again, 
and we're going to look at the increased heart rate and what causes that.